And we're back. Bags and Boards, the best comic book podcast in the world. Number 47. Is it really 47? (laughs) 77. Wow. Starting out strong. But it's because of the convention, San Diego Comic-Con weekend. You know, it's two weeks back. And I am still tired from it, but it was such an amazing convention. And Ryan, you went, and the Golden Age Guru, who's also at the table, also went. Hit the like and subscribe button. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. I want to get to, like, destroying comic books in this conversation. I have a surprise at the end of the show that neither of you are aware of. But first, Jeff, you were actually set up at San Diego. You got one-on-one time with comic hunters, dealers, artists coming up to the booth, buying stuff. What was it like? I mean, look, San Diego Comic Con had extra energy this year. It yeah, really did. It really um, did. And we've t- talked, you know, we've heard. I mean, not having um, people disappear from the show floor to go get those signatures or announcements, um, you know, or just photo opportunities with artists or with, excuse me, with actors and actresses really helped keep the energy constant for the entire time. And that doesn't happen. I mean, the general swing at a convention for an exhibitor is not even always high. There's just like a decent energy, and then there's real lows because it just gets quiet because you just know something's going on and the floor is empty. I have to was, assume it's because of the writer strike and the actor strike. 100%. And that's what I was insinuating to earlier is just that people just stayed there, and they had a few extra bucks. And I haven't seen a convention where people were digging through the boxes in the front just to get back issues um, like that for probably eight plus years now. Originally, I thought it was maybe five years. And then I started really thinking, when was the last time people were really digging for these back issues? And it has to be at least eight years where people are trying to fill in holes. Key books, there was always there was the keys that people were specking on, and people were still buying keys. But the back issues, it was really fun to see people digging through those books. I went digging. I got, like, my favorite character in all of comic books. I got Sinestro's first appearance in Green Lantern number seven, I think. I'm not even 100% sure what number it is. I'm just trying to acquire every Green Lantern issue ever, and I finally pulled the trigger on a low-grade copy of the first appearance of Sinestro at San Diego Comic-Con. And it kind of sounds nice hearing you explain it that, like, at previous San Diego's, this was my first time, uh, that there were times when people would not be there for a little bit, when everyone would kind of disperse. Is that... Is that how you're making it? That's how you're making it sound. And I know from uh, this experience this past or two weeks ago now that it was just wall to wall people all weekend. Yeah. And, you know, I got to say, I mean, a couple things from your statement make me really, really proud. First of all, um, I feel like a mama bird who's pushed his little bird out of the nest to fly because I believe there has to be at least one or two podcasts we've done where you said you would never own that book because you didn't think you would ever buy a key book like that. And, I think only in like the last three months, that's a short amount of time, you were now buying the first Sinestro. I opened it up first. You want to know something to to even compound on that? Upon entry of this room, because um, we're going to get into some coverage about this brand new independent company. Spoiler, Ryan's wearing a distillery shirt, but he has a comic book to talk about this publisher. And he said when he was taking the pictures of it to prep for the show, he doesn't want to open the comic out of the bag because he wants to submit it. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I mean, we should talk about like... We'll get into all that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a whole segment. Hey, we're going to wait on that. All right, so stay tuned. So that's amazing. Okay, but I also think it's amazing that that was in a back issue bin. Green yeah. Lantern 7. I so. wish I, remember. I, should, I should remember who sold it to me because they had a very, very great booth with uh, a lot of really, really pretty Silver Age books. I was, even me, and I'm not one who likes to drool over old books, but I was like, ah, oh, these colors are really good. Ah, oh, there's a very strong lack of spine ticks on some of these books. The podcast is working. It only man. works on Green Lantern, and once I get them all, I'm done. I'm yeah, out. I'm just only, wait. Yeah. That's how it starts. It uh, right. always starts. But you do mention something. I never really thought about this because I knew, like, okay, lack of celebrity appearances, less people on the show show floor, let alone in the comic section, which is typically like you have to go around a corner, through a door, you know, under into the basement section. Like it's a comic book convention, but the comic books are like in the corners of the room. And knowing that members weren't going to the celebrity section and dropping $100 after standing in line for two hours, an hour, sometimes even longer, depending on the celebrity, means that there's more money for them to buy at the show. And if you're at a comic book show, more likely you know, increases the odds that they're going to come out with some funny books. And I like that. It's great when you can come to a comic shop or excuse me, a comic show and you actually spend your money on comics. Like it's called comic con. 
And comic books are usually a third tier thought for a lot of attendees, but it was nice to see that having that money that they still thought about comics. They're like, oh, you know what? I have this money. Let's go back to where it started and let's put it into a $20 book, a $30 book and buy a few. And that's exactly what I saw. And I haven't seen that in a very long time. I got a chance to hunt with so many of my homies, Davis Ryder, Eris Quinones, even Destiny FOMO. We did a live stream and took a bunch of people around the comic book area, bought some really cool stuff. But we didn't just go down there to drop a bunch of awesome San Diego Comic-Con drops. We went down there to debut the Ash Can for Crashdown, which is in previews right now. And you can order issue number one, support Ryan and I's first published work. We also did some of our first signings. Shout out Michael Calero. Shout out Massive. Yeah, that was a weird experience that, uh, looking back, it definitely feels like a surreal like video that I watched somebody else live through. But we did a, a pretty cool signing at the uh, at the Hero House as well with uh, with Stashley, with Jay Stash himself. You know, like he talks to the big people, the big boys, the celebrities. And it made it made me feel pretty cool. It was it was a cool time. Yeah, it was nuts. We were sitting next to like Aaron Bartling doing signings at one point, sitting next to Drew Zucker at one point, so was a Micah, just like hanging out with these amazing creatives and kind of getting a taste of what their day was like. We also chatted with Todd McFarlane a lot. Yeah, he's not kidding. We we had several different conversations with Todd uh, of varying relevance to comic books. He got into some weird topics that I wouldn't think somebody would talk about. We should talk about one of those topics. Do you dude. want to? You want I to tell think that story? Should. Dude, he tells that story to so many people. To strangers, like the first time he meets them. So yeah, I guess we can. A little bit of like Gary V vibes in a good way. I love me some Gary V, but like he's definitely someone who likes to inspire people when he has a brief moment to chat. And he's definitely someone who loves the grind, who loves the hustle. And I don't think I've actually told you this, Jeff. No. So this is a conversation we had. We're um, in this party. Image Comics hosted this party. They have all their toys around. Todd McFarlane's making his, ra- making his rounds. And this is like an invite-only type of thing. They got food. They have donuts. They had uh, fresh tacos and things like that. And Todd comes up, and we're chatting amongst ourselves. He walks up. And obviously the conversation is now about, you know, meeting Todd because you only get so much time with him. And he starts getting into the grind. You know, I don't remember how it came up. CGC signings. Oh, I mentioned that he was going nuts doing the CGC signing because of how long it must have taken him. So he takes it upon himself to tell me this story and a bunch of people, right? We're there with AKA Mr. Bolo. Shout out Adam, you know, the whatnot team, Davis Ryder, uh, Jem Mint, Fiona, you know, they're all there. And Todd says, you know, I sat down. And I started doing the signings and I look at all the boxes and I am starting to do the math in my head. You know, I'm talking as if I was Todd. And he's telling me in the group that he's figuring out he's going to be here for days. Like there's just, he knows how long it takes him to do one signature. You know, he has this down to a science. So he's doing the math and he's realizing he's got to buckle up. He's going to be doing this committed task for a long time. So then he says something I didn't expect. He goes, here's the thing, Tom. When you're in it, You got to be in it. You got to do the grind. You got to focus. And I'm over here watching employees, you know, sip their coffee. I look over here and someone's eating a snack. And you know what that means? Let me teach you something. When you put things in this hole, stuff comes out of the other hole. If you want to prevent stuff from coming out of the other hole, you don't put things in this hole. And he's literally telling us that when he's doing the grind as Todd McFarlane, he doesn't eat. He doesn't drink. He just works. And that way he doesn't have to take breaks. So when lunch came and everyone's like, hey, we're going to go get some food. We're taking lunch breaks. He goes, so who's going to be here with me? Because I'm not taking a break. And they had to restructure the whole signing so that they could have employees at CGC like take shifts to take breaks because Todd wasn't stopping. That sounds so miserable. You're going to be there for hours just signing. And on top of that, you don't get food or drink or break. So it's like, Todd, I'm glad Todd's put that on himself. But yeah, that doesn't sound like something I would do. But I'm, I'm no Todd McFarlane. So I guess that tracks. Well, well, hold up here, though. How much money is that lost to him if he doesn't, if he takes just, let's t- say it takes six minutes? Of your time to get up, stretch, go use, go down the hall, use the restroom, come back, wash your hands. I mean, six minutes of Todd signing is what? Let's just say he does three signature, uh, three seconds of signature. Todd McFarlane, swipe. 
you know, maybe five. I mean, we're talking each one is probably a hundred dollars a sig, give or take. So five seconds, sixty. We got what's like is that twelve a, a minute? So seventy-two signatures, seventy-two hundred dollars potentially in a six-minute piss. What he needs to do is make one more hole, right, and just cut a hole in the bottom of that chair and get his employees to feed him a little snack, give him like a drink with a straw in it, so he can, you know, keep signing while he's eating and drinking. And then, you know, everything, whatever happens down below the chair happens down below the chair, and he keeps signing. Yeah, he needs to get that bag for urine, like a decatheter, and maybe that is what. He, oh my gosh! Todd, go a little deeper. All right. So, before we keep going on this uh, Todd McFarlane conversation, we found ourselves on Sunday at a dinner with our artist Ben Temple Smith and a bunch of really cool creatives, some artists, um, and also. Thomas, the editor of Spawn. Thomas Healy, correct. Shout out Thomas, great guy. Had a couple of drinks with them, and he loves Spawn. It was awesome getting to like learn about the the creative workflow and how much excitement he has about it. it makes me like want to read more Spawn. But I mentioned this story because Todd was telling it a few times. You know, like not the story, but like his 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 advice about you know work ethic. And Thomas mentioned he's like, yo. Pay attention. There's a lot of protein drinks all around. He just chugs those down. But also, Todd is the first person to be like, if you question it, he'll whip out the guns and be like, you see this? That's what the protein drinks get. That's what this work ethic gets. Like he's pro- And to his credit, Todd looks great. He is a specimen of health in this hobby. And not, meant, not everyone can – you can't say that for everybody. So God bless him. It seems like he's always been that way, too. So it's kind of more like a lifestyle, not just a recent choice for him. So kudos to that, Todd. Never thought I'd be talking about holes the first time I had a real conversation with McFarland. But we did have a recent podcast, Jeff, talking about this massive collection find and purchase we made over 300,000 comic books, over $350,000 invested. Go check out the last podcast number 76 for that story. But one thing we did mention is that in the entire collection, the collector had been purchasing comic books and speculating on comic books every year, dating back to the early 90s, even like the late 80s. And it didn't just like stop in 1999 or 2005. No, the boxes had dates on them And they went to 2022, the year we bought the collection. So I thought it would be fun to hit up Jeff and see if we can get one of those boxes and just see what's inside today. And what did you bring? Yeah, so I wasn't sure at first how far his collecting went. Um, We just didn't have that information. But um, I did start doing some digging, and I did find a box that says 2022 on it. Uh, I haven't checked a month. Give me a second. I'm actually excited about this because I could maybe know more about this than either of you two because I've been like reading current books for the last five years, and I don't know if you guys are as well-versed in the recent, recent modern stuff, so I might actually uh, know more about this. Per tradition at this point, we've done this multiple times. Let's have yeah. Ryan so th- take a look inside. Now, this was completely sealed Okay, yes. right before we started filming this, so that's None of why us I have brought seen it. it. Yeah, I said 2022. This still had uh, paper tape on it. We have photos, video. You'll see it here or there, wherever the heck it is. Um, but Ryan's going to take a peek because he knows this stuff. I don't know. So I don't even in know theory. what's in comics or it could be anything. So Ryan's opening this up. Also, I want to remind everybody, if you don't want to watch us, you know, you want to, like, listen to us, if you can't be tied to the YouTube screen, probably watching us on Double Time. You can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, not Stitcher. That's ending this year, but iTunes as well. And you can just download that and see it. And what do we have, Ryan? I'm laughing right now. I'll tell you why in a second. <laughs> oh, this is hard like, covers. Oh, specking I, on some trades. Uh, yeah. What, what, what hard covers are there, Ryan, that you're going to educate us on? Yeah. Since you know, <laughs> I got no idea. Since you know it so well in 2020. I was expecting like Black Panther number three. Like maybe Tosin <laughs> shows up in here or something. This what? is Silver Age Classics Kona of oh. Volume Two from Dell Comics. Unexplored Worlds from Charlton Comics. Got nothing. I got nothing. Here you go. You got Back silver aging gold needs. Yeah, you trades, break those yeah. out. We'll get shots of that. But this collector wasn't just buying comics. He was buying hardcovers as well. What else we got? Batman versus Ra's al Ghul. Neil, Neil Adams. Adams. Yeah. Ooh, that's cool. Hardcover. Still sealed. Can't go wrong with that. So he wasn't just like specking on these are, floppies. These are he was like, too. ooh, Neil Ooh, Adams hardcover? One. I want that. 80 Years of the Boy Wonder, the deluxe edition. That is a Robin hardcover in here. 
I mean, That's pretty cool. We've talked about how massive his trade collection was. Yeah. I mean, we had to, that was. It was the first thing that we handled. It you was. know, while we were there, we, there were so many hardcovers and we were just thinking about how much weight everything was going to be to transport. And we have some friends who are like, and a previous really? guy. <laughs> oh, with Ninjago on the top. You, you, you know, you know that he was ready to order again. Well, let's open up this package because it's got some <laughs> late, so early Silver Age stuff in here. But and some of this has got Ditko art in it too, which is kind of cool. You know, I don't know if we, how deep we want to go. Here's this. What is this? This is the whole oh clip. Wow, is this his entire order form for the month? It must be. That's a packet. There's several pages. It would, pages it would make sense that it would go in this box because it's up. a lighter box. Oh, oh my gosh! Look at this. <laughs> Let me just It's check a manifesto. His order form for the month. Oh my goodness. Yo, Chuck, you know, from Mile High Comics has been supplying this gentleman for comics. He's probably one of his best customers. We got to keep this and we got to bring it to Chuck and show him. Be like, we have the proof. We have the data. We have the evidence. We bought Larry's collection. We got the documents. There it is. But that right there just showed you like... He was specking. He was buying hardcovers. He was buying multiple copies of some things. And today we just unboxed a bunch of hardcovers. Hit the like. Slap and subscribe. We're here every single week covering the comic book marketplace, but we're hitting the table at least two to three times a month for the comic community to not just report on comics, but to have some active discussions about funny books. And Ryan, you're wearing this shirt. And I was really excited to see that you wanted to talk about this because there's little, I know very little about this brand new independent comic book company. But what I will say is I walked past their booth at San Diego Comic-Con and I was impressed. It was clean. The marketing was so crisp. I'm like, wait, is what, what, what company is, is this? this? Yeah, it's brand and new. To, and to find out that it's a comic book company, I'm like, okay, I'm in. Like, what, what's going on here? And then I saw some of the creative names, Jock, Zack Snyder. Scott Snyder, not Zack Snyder. Different Zack, different Scott, different, different Snyder. Snyder. <laughs> Merka and Dolfo was on this list. Like, spit your shit, Ryan. Yeah, no, I've been on. I've been uh, on Distillery since they uh, first announced. I think back in like April or something, which is when I received the email and uh, pre-ordered this limited print run shirt that says like "Founding Fan" on the on the arm here. It's got a list of all the creators. Tom barely mentioned a few of them, but that's, that's all on the backside. Uh, but yeah, the, the creators involved with this are uh, extensive and extremely, extremely impressive, which is the main reason that I even kind of noticed or cared, to be uh, brutally honest, in the first place. But uh, let me read some of them off for you. We've got Merka and Dolfo, Brian Azzarello, Mark Bernardin, Elsa Chartier, Becky Cloonan, Lee Garbett, Jock, Joel Jones, Tula Lote, Jamie McKelvey, Junko Mizuno, Stephanie Phillips, Scott Snyder, James Tynan IV, and Rom V., and those are all just the uh, founding creators as well. But uh, when, once you dig a little bit further into this publisher, it gets even more interesting because it was created and founded by um, two comicsology executives, one of whom is named David Steinberger. And he was a, uh, actually a co-creator of comicsology from way back when. And then you have Chip Mosher, who is the uh, head of comicsology content, their head of content. And he helped, I think he helped spearhead like the Scott Snyder comicsology original stuff that just happened relatively recently. But when you start looking at Comixology, too, and Amazon bought them out, like, I don't know, within the last decade or so, and last year specifically, Amazon made the really foolish decision to kind of merge the platform Comixology with, like, the Kindle platform, and those two don't really mesh very well, and Comixology kind of just got gutted. And it's very, very unfortunate, and it's very difficult to, uh, you can't buy things on the app anymore, you have to upload a separate Google Chrome and, like, download and purchase your products through a completely separate it's it's a whole it's a whole mess it's not a fun app to use anymore and i was actually a really big fan of comiXology but now we have distillery coming out which is a publisher slash digital publisher so all of the creators that i just listed are founding creators and they have a stake in the company as well what is this oversized comic book foil with that d on the cover well, this D stands for Distillery, and this is a uh, convention exclusive, a San Diego convention exclusive. Uh, it's called The Devil's Cut, which is a one-shot that features 11 different stories in here from the creators that I just listed earlier. And uh, it's only going to be printed once. It's uh, It was in the catalog a couple months ago, and I pre-ordered every variant that I could because I'm uh, a little bit obsessed. And uh, yeah, it's not going to be printed again. There were two different San Diego exclusive variants. I got the more expensive one. I didn't want to get both because it's very hard to transport a magazine book on an airplane if you don't have the right store folio. But I really want to get this graded. Okay, hold up. 
So you went out of your way to at San Diego Comic Con to seek this out and buy it, right? It didn't come with your, you know, founding fan membership. No, I actually didn't know this existed until I got to uh, the con. I didn't even know Distillery was going to have a booth at the con. But like mm-hmm. Tom said, it's it pops. Like they had that's crazy bright yellow colors, and it was just a very stark, clean, minimalistic kind of booth. And then right there on the table, they had a bunch of these spread out: the gold foil one, and then the uh, the lower price. Uh, Non-foil is just a bright yellow to match the colors of their booth. That was the non-foil exclusive. But those are the two San Diego exclusives for The Devil's Cut. It's the only way to read The Devil's Cut right now. It hasn't. It doesn't officially drop uh, until the end of August. But I went through last night super carefully <laughs> with two gloves, which I don't usually do. And I read, without without trying to crack the square bound, I read I read everything in there. And I took notes. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little obsessed. But I'm, I have a lot of faith in all of the stories in here. There were 11 stories and eight of them are going to be spun off into ongoing titles moving forward. I also haven't even gotten into the digital aspect of Distillery because they are going to publish books through LCSs like the normal way, but there's also going to be a digital component where they release the issues on their website for one week only. So when issue one of one of these series drops, you have a one-week window to buy however many copies uh, people want, and then that's it. They, they You cannot buy them from Distillery. But you are able to resell your digital copies on the distillery platform to other people who maybe missed the boat and want to get the digital copy later, especially if it's a low physical print count and you can't they're, – they're trying to adapt the physical collectability resell market, secondary market nature to digital. You want to know what that is eerily similar to? But not like an NFT? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. They specifically steered away from that, which is another reason I'm a little more excited because I'm not on that. I'm, I'm not on that train. Yeah, I mean, the thing I don't like is them taking away from paper to digital. I mean, if they're, they're not taking tra- away; they're doing both. It's going to be well, joint release. Like, oh, I thought you were just saying they're trying to curve people into that, especially for the oh, no. secondary market of people wanting a copy of this to read it. So it sounds like we're not going to reprint this. So you have to only get it digitally. I believe they're going to re. Uh, they haven't said anything about not reprinting anything. I think if if a book sells out, I'm pretty sure they'll do like second printings or you know whatever whatever publishers normally do. But as far as the digital copies go, there's going to be a one week window where you can buy it for cover price, I assume, from the distillery website. And then if you miss the boat and you want to buy it from somebody else, you can sell the copy you purchased that week so to that- somebody else, and the creators get a cut oh, so of every only- sale that happens after the fact on the digital mm-hmm. side. Mm-hmm. I've heard that for digital uh, NFT art like that. So you're saying that's just for the digital aspect of it. It's mm-hmm. just a one-time release. Um, you get it when whatever free comic book t- or whatever uh, Wednesday comes out for digital. Correct. That's kind of cool. I dig that. It kind of does like almost the opposite of what you thought he said. Yeah. Because most of the time, you know, if you have it digitally, you know, you're doing it after it comes out on Wednesday to kind of preserve the LCS grind so that they can sell their copies, people can read it physically, and then eventually, if they want to, get it digital so they can not have to acquire the comic books one by one to read the story. But in this particular case, they are actually limiting the digital acquisition to such a small amount of time that it kind of creates it as its own collectible which is one thing, but it also then makes it so that you really want to get the physical as well. I dig that because um, instead of just having something like Comixology where you're just buying the book and it's just a digital version, this is actually a collectible version that you can have for the cost of – what is the cost? Is it like a normal price of a book or is it something it, I assume it's going to be a little more than a regular book because at least the Devil's Cut, the preview – it's almost like a preview ash can, if, if you will. Uh, it's definitely magazine size. It's bigger. Uh, but I don't know the exact price yet on the on the actual standalone series. I'm assuming they're going to be more than four dollars though for the digital. Probably, I would assume they match the digital and the uh, physical prices, similar to what Comicsology did. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Comicsology, you could just go on and buy an issue anytime. This is like the inverse to what Bad Idea does in that they will never make a second printing, third printing, fourth, etc. Like other publishers will do. What they'll do is they'll release issue one. That's the print count. That's the release. And then they'll make a not second printing cover. They literally put that on the comic book and that they are very outspoken about going back to the well and just reprinting as much as they need to to meet any demand that there is for the comic. But knowing that it's not a second printing means that there's not a limited amount of them because they didn't go back to press one time. They can go back to press on that anytime. Just shooting the collectible in the foot and saying this will never be a collectible because we can just endlessly make them. What's cool about the Devil's Cut is the 11 stories in here are also uh, original 
prequels. They aren't previews. They're not like samples of things that are going to be coming out in the new series that are launched out of this one-shot anthology series. So these are uh, first appearances of all of these characters are going to be in this Devil's Cut one-shot. Uh, the first book that's actually coming to press is currently in the catalog. It's going to be called Gone. Uh, it's written and illustrated by Jock, and it spins out of one of the stories called The Stowaway from this book about a little girl in a dystopian future who tries to like steal bread off of a ship, uh, a supply ship, that suddenly takes off, and she just barely manages to uh, like leave the ship with before getting like blasted off into space as a little stowaway, like street rat kind of kid. So, I'm interested to see how that story continues, and I'm very much going to check out Gone when it comes out in October. So, there's 11 stories in this thing. Yes, most of them are like five pages. There's a couple in here that are like eight or eleven, but yeah, it's a it's a bunch of little short stories, and I loved most of them. But it's an anthology, so yeah, they can't they can't all be my jam. But the things I didn't like are going to be somebody else's cup of tea, and I, I'm I'm just excited. I'm excited to get my hands on a reader copy of this because I am never going to open this again, and I want to get it slabbed and sent off and not have to worry about it because it's. Uh, it's already going up in price. I checked eBay last night. I want to see some attaboys in the comment section below for that. We're trying to, like, enable the collector within you, Ryan, and we're, we're bringing that out, and, I, and I'm excited. I want to talk about destroying comic books. I want to talk about manufactured collectibles here today. Um, there's a YouTuber, friend of mine, Bryce Comics, who released a interesting comic book, and he did it in a very unique way. And what ended up happening is a little controversy, but... Overall, it has showcased what I think is just a disdain for parts of the collector's market that I want to talk about, because I think at the root of it, it's about destroying comic books. Yeah, we're talking about, right, um, just how to make something that is printed more scarce, because we are, when I say we really, anybody who's printing a comic book, there's a minimum that you have to order, Correct. And which is, I think, different from Marvel and DC, right? And that then there's also trade dress versus virgin versus foils. And I think you could speak on that better just to get an understanding, right? Because I have like maybe a slight, um, some slight knowledge just gravitating around you how it is. And it just seems like for you to print anything really uh, limited isn't necessarily an option. And so it almost like your hand is forced to have to destroy comics to get to a limited amount of comics, which is just <clears throat> which is just a little interesting on how, you know, you have to destroy to create. And it's so I, I don't know, I, maybe you can go deeper into it cuz I'm not even sure on all the numbers. Can we dumb it down real quick for like the Ryans in the in the audience here because um you guys are talking specifically about store variants, right? And like any any LCS owner is able to just order like eight copies of Moon Knight that week, for example, right? Like there's no minimum order requirements for regular books through a local comic shop, unless you're talking about like one in tens, one in 25 ratio variance type thing. But if somebody wants to order 13 copies of the Avengers, they're not going to make you order 3000 copies just to run your shop. Right. And that's a, that's a different conversation. Correct. Yeah. We're talking about store variants. It's an option that, you know, those who have an account uh, through Marvel to be able to bring to press something special for themselves, something that otherwise wouldn't have been made or at least wouldn't have been made by them. So, they team up with an artist, they work with a publisher, um, and they make something unique, a, a variant cover. And the print counts are different by publisher. And rule of thumb, if it's like a smaller publisher, you're going to be looking at like between 500 and 1,000 minimum print run. And that includes the different versions of the cover, trade dress, virgin, color splash. Um, foils can be a little different, you know, depending on the publisher. You know, those are more expensive to make, so those are typically a lower print count. The big, like, you know, giants, Marvel and DC, you're looking at, like, to really go a full swing with, like, uh, trade dress and virgin, you know, upwards of needing 4,000 on the low end covers produced. If you're looking at foils, I mean, it, the sky's the limit with some of these things. You know, there's Marvel comics that have come out. I've seen print counts. I have yet done a foil Marvel variant myself. You know, I bought some from my homies, but I've never actually gone through the process where I added that to my order. But the print counts that I've seen others release, 3,000 trade, 1,000 virgin, you have to assume that that unlocks each other, right? Yeah. In order to do the virgin, you have to do the trades. I assume in order to do the foils, you have to do that 4,000. And the only print count I've seen over at Marvel right now that other stores have released was 3,000 foils. So you're talking a 7,000 print run, one cover, 
three different options. That's a crap ton of books. So I don't know how you move that many books. So obviously scarcity has to play some factor in here. So like break it down for me. Well, basically right now we're seeing a lot of stores like combine efforts. You know, I do a lot of books with my homies, Davis Ryder, Sean from Carnivore Comics, BTC, you know, cause it's 7,000 books. Like even like Midtown would have trouble moving that many books. Right. Um, and also we shouldn't say seven. We should just say around the four, three, four thousand marker, because that's going to be like ninety nine percent of those higher end, big, you know, Marvel DC types of books. You know, that's like public. People can look this up. You know, they can see it online and just the print counts that exist because no one's looking for more. You know, they're trying to fight for less. And I think that's an important part to distinguish because I think the first part of this equation that happens that leads to the destruction of books is upon arrival there's going to be damages. So the number's already fluctuating. So you got to start with that. You're, you're not going to ever really have 3,000 perfect books. You're going to have books that have torn covers and books that you're never even going to want to break out to sell. So, you know, 3,000 is almost hardly ever the true number. It's always going to be less. Wasn't there a time when, like, a forklift drove through, like, a whole case of comics for the mail call one time and, like, it totally, obviously destroyed that whole case worth of books? And, like, so, yeah, like... You're destroying stuff uh, intentionally or not, like right out the gate sometimes. Yes, and going through a process of getting replacements, each publisher has their own thing, but many publishers will require you to actually like tear the cover of the damaged copies to preserve that print count. And some will even make you ship them those those covers to back to the publisher so that they have the proof that it happened and you know, if they don't get the right counts, they'll charge you for those books, right? So there are processes to this. Um, on the other end, you know, as far as like um, just straight up getting rid of books, you know, the books that I can think of where we've actually had to destroy where we didn't necessarily have to do it was because of, um, I'm trying to think like the most recent one. I would say 300, the 25th anniversary issue number one. Um, the virgin minimums of that book were 500, right? And I knew... Upon arrival, we were going to have damages, probably 25, maybe 50, maybe 100. And I saw a lot of people already cutting their print counts, their print counts down to 300. And I thought, that makes sense. The book is called 300. We're going to have a cert on the back. Do I want it to say 432 printed of 300 issue number one? I thought, no, it actually would be a cooler collectible to have it be a round number. And it wasn't even my idea. There's a lot of other stores that did it. But that's a small number. I want to get back to Bry because this all has to do with something recent because this has happened time and time again. This is nothing new. Well, Bry had a couple of things go strange with a Gabriel Del Auto cover release. Now, he did a full breakdown of what happened and talked about it on his channel. I encourage you to watch that. I don't want to dive too deep into it. But there's a couple parts to it that I think if it was just one thing, no one would care. If it was just one of the few things that went wrong, rather one of the few things that people, you know, could complain about. But because there was a few things that kind of all compiled to a lot of conversations about this very topic, destruction of comics, retailer variants, and how they're sold. This is the part of collecting and business that is either going to rub you the wrong way or it's not. This is where we got the mystery boxes things and people manufacturing scarcity for comics to, to make something, you know, creative and fun for the hobby. So there was, what, Amazing Spider-Man 26, uh, Gabriel Delato cover, and there was uh, 480 that were put aside, if you will say, that were to come back 9-8. And that was a print run of 3,000 for the trade dress. Now, there was a virgin version that's only going to have 29.8 or better, okay? But the person who gets to decide what happens with those books outside of the one who made that cutoff line is the company that's going to destroy them, which is just interesting because I never knew that was a service till recently. So CGC will take an entire 3,000 book run and you let them know that you need, let's say, 480, like in this situation, nine eights or better, and they will destroy the 2,520 copies for you and or the 980 if you're doing the virgin, which is fascinating to me. So the goal with this is to make a very low print Gabriel Del Auto cover. Like, out the gate, as someone who doesn't do a whole lot of grading, but has already admitted this very podcast that you're going to be dabbling, 
Like, what are the things that you think of first? Because I, I can completely empathize with people who are like, wait a minute, CGC, the grading company, is the one who's doing the grading and the destruction. But also, who else would you want to have it done it by? It feels off. It feels off. Because if you're going to send that many and they're going to be like, okay, cool, we got 489.8 or better, but we have all these other ones that uh, didn't get that high of a grade or like uh, maybe they did. Maybe you got all of them at 9.8. Oh, they probably didn't even get to them. They go through until they find the high grade. And once they get that number, they toss the rest. So there's some part of me that's like kind of winces when I think about like perfectly fine comics, especially beautiful Gabriel Delato comics, just getting trashed because you're, you're meeting a specific arbitrary number. But at the same time, are they supposed to CG? The other alternative, I guess, is CGC sends those back to you as the client and then you destroy them and then send them back to Marvel too? Or like, it just feels like the other option would just be way more of a, of a headache and a runaround. Well, there's no reason to send them 3,000 if they're not going to destroy them. The traditional way to release a book and get nine eights out the gate is to send a stack of books that you want and you send it in for like a pre-screen where they'll grade a certain amount trying to get that to you. And whatever that amount is, once they hit it, They'll reject the rest so that you don't have to pay the full cost to get back lower graded books. But you wouldn't send them the whole print run. In this case, this is for the sole purpose of this comic only exists in this form. There's only 480 of them in a trade dress. There's only 20, making the entire print run 500. Knowing that means that 3,500 comics had to be tossed, I think is already something that, as you said, makes you wince a little bit. You're like, I don't know if I like that. But hey... I'm someone who threw away at least 100 300s to make it a 300 round number. It's just different ends of the spectrum. But I want to get into why that bothers people, but also compound this with this has been done before. It happens all the time. But because this Gabriel Del Auto art was realized after the fact that it has been used before in Marvel Italy in in production for like a graphic novel, I believe, a Foreign comic from like two th the early 2000s has used this cover and that coming to light, not being realized that this art has been used before and is old, I think it compounded the issue. Yeah, the disconnect between um, foreign versions or company brands that share the name Marvel is interesting. Okay, and it's not a surprise that they're not all communicating with each other because this was what Marvel Panini or something along those lines that put this out in 04 and 20 years later, which re it's resurfacing now as being pitched as a new cover through Marvel, who I don't, US Marvel, who didn't even know probably. But also there's like this whole other component on here that these were sold in Bry's mystery boxes too. So that's like, what do you, what do you get? You know, it's a, is it, is it, was it a guaranteed? Is it like a one per box thing with the box? Yeah. One per box, you get the nine, eight trade. Okay. You may get the Virgin. And that's how they were all moved. They sold out real quick, especially because he also adds other things in there. There's chase books, et cetera. But in this particular case, there was a manufactured scarcity for this book. And really, when you go down the line, it's not wrong to destroy books like that happens. You know, there's a part of the hobby here where you're creating the scarcity. But then also you're working with artists who have control and you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I've done Gabriel Del Auto covers before, and I have done original Gabriel Del Auto covers, but also I've worked with other publishers, and I won't get into, like, specifics, but, like, I've been hit up with existing art. Like, hey, it's never been published, by the way. You know, that's, that's unusual in this, is that this has been published before. That's not something that's, you know, something that you would want to know. So you can solicit it. I actually personally think it's pretty badass that an Italian version of a book— of Gabriel Dotto that exists that I can't ever get now exists for the first time. So like I can see the inverse of that. Like that's kind of cool. But he sold it as a mystery box because everyone was guaranteed one because there's solid numbers. You can guarantee something and you're guaranteeing something cool. Yes, the book spiked up in value. And in regards to Gabriel Del Otto's like, you know, place in all this, he's a very popular artist, you know? You got to get in line to work with him. You know, as far as like working with these these great um, individuals, these this very talented individuals, the grind is like trying to make that magic happen sometimes for years. I mentioned the Invincible cover that I made uh, through Skybound. It took me over a year to get that done, and it almost didn't happen. 
You know, working with Gab for me took me years to make happen. And I did it with the homie, shout out Sean from Carnivore Comics. We made this badass House of Secrets 92, first appearance of Swamp Thing. But it took a very long time to get it done. And Gab had to be like about the cover. You know, he says no a lot, but he was inspired by it and he did it. But there's also a lot of creators that are just making a bunch of stuff. You know, I've worked with publishers where it's like, here's multiple pieces of art that we said no to. These are the ones that we said yes to. And they're kind of like renditions of the same art. They're just like the character looks a little bit better in these versions. So you can pick from these two. But I've seen the others because that original art ends up coming to the market. And you go, oh, that's kind of like an alt cover to something that exists, but it never made it to press because the publisher said no. So also publishers are managing a crap ton of titles. And that's a lot of artwork. They're collecting this artwork over time in certain cases. And there are times where if you want to work with Gabriel Delato, he may have something that he drew a while ago that he is now bringing to Marvel or another publisher that you can buy. Now, the unknown of it being released in the past, I imagine that that was a slip up or maybe Gab's team didn't think it was a big deal because it was never published in the United States. <sighs> yeah, that's an interesting one, too. Um, you know, what... What they knew and didn't know, you know, you can always just go with the benefit of the doubt. And what you can do the same thing with Bryce. Either you trust Bryce or you don't, or you trust Gab or you don't, or you trust Marvel or you don't, or you trust CGC or you don't. That's what this hobby is about. You either trust these people or you don't. I choose to trust quite a few of them, all right? And so that's kind of the perspective I'm going, especially when you actually get to meet people in person and you actually under, you know, see them opposed to just judging somebody through uh, a site or a, uh, their hashtag or their page. So that's just kind of the way I choose to go with it. And, you know, it's like I said, some do and some don't. So um, it's this interesting factor because that's the four things, right? CGC destroying books, um, right? The the 9.8 assigned grades, the mystery boxes. It's all this crazy perfect storm of just things that people can all really hate all at once. And it just relives itself. And it's so interesting because it just seems like it's more like a massive miscommunication between multiple people and someone doing something that many people already do. Just creating the scarcity thing. Throughout all of this, too, we also found out that this is not the first time this has happened, and it's not the first time it's happened with Delato specifically, too, where older covers, specifically in uh, Marvel Italy, which, again, does not communicate with Marvel US or whatever, you know, the main Marvel over here is. They're separate entities. So it kind of makes sense that this uh, sort of slip-up would happen more than once. And, yeah, this is, this is not the first time it's happened. It just feels like one of the first times it's happened this publicly. Considering that the retailer's hands are tied in regards to how much they have to order, if you want there to be unique collectibles, they have to be manufactured to some degree and destruction happens. And I want to know your thoughts about this part of the business in the comment section below. I, for one, have thought about, like, you know, how could I make a one of one? Bry's done it before. And also, Marvel Italy's done it before. They did, like, a, a pack break. You could buy it, like, for five or six bucks, and they made a one of one version. You know, that stuff is being done by publishers, too. And I want to know your thoughts. And let's, like, bring this up a little bit. And this is no slight to Bry, but my Gabriel Delato cover was, like, fresh. It was brand new. And the original art is here because Jeff, the Golden Age guru, freaking bought it for $15,000. Hot damn. Yeah, I had to buy this, and um, it goes back to just childhood. There's a reason I bought this. You should re tell that story man there's some new people here we're going yeah all right this i don't also, know this story yeah you don't know the story there's a lot of new people here we're go we just hit 60k on youtube so that's pretty cool by the way let's get to 100k this year guys there's a lot of people who don't hit that subscribe button and just watch listen we're in your feed already just hit the subscribe we want to get to that 100 mark by the end of the year help us get to that 100 mark by the end of the year let's see if we can make this a goal and maybe we'll even plan a big giveaway yeah, I pull up the numbers between 40 and 50% of our viewers do not subscribe to the channel. So you can help us get there. If we're halfway at 60, I mean, we should be able to break 100. And Jeff, tell us about this Swamp Thing story because I happen to know this is some of the earliest like comic purchasing, big comic purchasing that you ever did. Okay, so this is kind of why I was so, I gravitated to this artwork, okay? Um, when I was younger, uh, there was a TV series for Swamp Thing. Ran for about three seasons, 1990 to like 93, and I think it was on USA. I think there was even a movie too, like Return of the Swamp Thing. Anyways, I was a big fan of that, right? I didn't even, I didn't really know the comics yet at that time. 
I just knew the character through TV. And um, I started collecting comics around the early 90s, like heavily. About what age? Um, I was, let's see, I started high school when I was 12. All right, it was like young. And so um, along that time, I started going to conventions. I mean, conventions were just so much easier out then, you know. Like I met Stan Lee in a, with no line, and you could walk up to the guy and talk to him for free and get an autograph. I mean, this was that type of time. And uh, I remember there me wanting uh, House of Secrets 92. I right away dove into the old comics almost immediately when I was young. I mean, I got into a price guide. I would go to a great comic shop that had all this awesome books on the wall, and I just gravitated to old comics immediately. So when I went to a show and there was a House of Secrets 92 there that was signed by the creator Bernie Wrightson as well, and it was raw. This was like 1993, 94, okay? I remember buying that book and being so excited. It was the most expensive book I ever bought. I had to split it with a friend, okay? It cost $200, and it was allegedly a VF Plus at the time. And both of you had to pay $200? Or we you each paid 100 Okay. Okay. And did you ask your parents for money? Like, how did that go down? I just worked for money, and I hustled comics, okay? Do you so share I've, the book? How, who, who keeps it? How yeah. does that work? Okay, so that was in 1994. I ended up buying this book. The signature was on the first interior page, okay? And I did not see that book. Since the day I bought it. What? Okay, because I didn't have enough money to pay him back the $100 at the time. I didn't know this part in. of the story that you hadn't seen it. Okay, this no. is great. I'm glad yeah. we're going over hadn't this again. It. From 1994 till I finally contacted my buddy again. And I think this was, it was pre-pandemic. So I think this was 20, I think this was like 2019. It had to have been. Around there. Where I contacted, he's like, dude, do you still have this book? You don't care about it. I clearly care a lot about it. He's like, yeah, man, I got it. I think it's in my mom's house still. I was like, God, what could that mean? Where has this been for the last, you know, 20 plus years, 25 years, right? And uh, sure enough, he finds it. We meet up and I get it. And I'm looking at it and I was like, oh, this is a nice book. It didn't get like kicked around. Nothing like got damaged on it. And, um, we try to figure out a value. I was like, hey, I was half into it. You were half into it. Here's kind of what it sells for. I'll just give you half the money. It's value. And he's like, great. No problem. He didn't care. All right. So I got the book back, and I, and I remember opening it up, and, like, the signature was huge. I was like, whoa, and a big gold mark. I did not remember any of that. Okay? I mean, it was, like, it was gigantic. I'll have pictures up here. I'll bring some. I'll send some photos of it. And uh, – so that book always kind of had this place because it was something I bought. I hadn't seen. I always thought about it. I just never really was took the initiative. And then I finally was like, you know what? I'm getting this freaking book back. And then um, my wife also loved Swamp Thing. And she got me one of our first anniversaries, like a Swamp Thing comic number nine. She didn't know anything about Swamp Thing. She bought some comic from a comic store. They sold her, and she gave it to me, which was awesome. And so, anyways, this, this attachment to Swamp Thing has always been there. I'm never going to own the cover to House Secrets 92. Metropolis Comics owns it. It's hanging in their wall. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to, you know, it's just not going to be sold. And I'll never be able to afford it. But, but, I just happen to know this guy who knew a guy who made a comic cover, all right, by this artist uh. named Gabriel Delato. Him and I are tight now. I call him Gelato. We're tight like that. <laughs> no, that's not true. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I was uh, working on this project with Sean over at Carnivore Comics, and we were excited to bring House of Secrets 92 to press. And Sean's, he's just got this great vision for variant comics, you know. I've learned a lot from him. Follow him on Instagram, on whatnot, and you should be signed up to his newsletter on carnivorecomics.com. He makes some of the most unique variants. And he did this, like, line of variants with Gabriel Otto where they redid an homage, but it's like... This it's it, instead of it being a like matching homage, it's an alt perspective of the same moment. He did an ASM one homage, you know, the same one where Spidey's in the tube, and we were just talking about how much we didn't like that cover recently. Well, it's from a different perspective. It's like from another angle, and it looks so damn cool. He did it with Hulk one as well, you know, Bruce Banner and you know, the Hulk coming up behind him. Well, the idea for House of Secrets ninety two, which has a cover of a girl combing her hair and Swamp Thing entering in from the background, and she has yet to see him yet. The idea was what would happen just a couple seconds later, and that's how this cover was created. Yeah, and I saw some pr pictures of what I was getting, and I was, I mean, it was instant. I was like, yep, that's it. I mean, I did not expect to. I wasn't in the best place to do it. Luckily, they, they do have a great payment plan, too, by the way. 
six to seven months, made little payments along the way, great communication, and finally finished, got it shipped to me, and um, it's been sitting, I've been trying to do this video with you for like a month and a half. It's been sitting on my floor for a month and a half. Sealed. How hard is it to like not open up that original art that you it's paid that money for? Yeah, it was it was not easy, man. I just, I kept looking at me in this, in this thing. I was like, is it okay? Can I leave it in there that long? All right, know. Jeff. Well, the, today's the day. Let's take a look at this original piece of artwork. All right. Good thing it's in the other room, so I got to go grab it. <laughs> so hold it tight. Let me go get it. Hand it to me, though, because I want to present it to you. I want to see your reaction. We had this on our notes written down here, too, that it says, you know, our different subjects that we're doing for this show. And it's got, like, San Diego Comic-Con recap and distillery segment. And there's one on here that just says Delato Original Art. And I just assumed Jeff got some random Delato artwork. I didn't realize it was the cover for this House of Secrets reprint that I've been looking at for months. So this will... I'm excited. I haven't seen this. Obviously, it's been in Jeff's house. So I want to get a reaction of both of you. Oh, I can see a little sliver already. All right. Okay. So, um, Jeff, this is your original piece of artwork. I assume you're going to get it framed up and put it in your casa. Yeah, show it to me. All right, you guys ready? Hit me with it. All right, comic fam. Boom. <sighs> Boom. Look at that. It's so pretty. I mean, look, in person. Wow. Man, real, like, Painted covers in person is almost unreal. I have another painted cover that's just outstanding by uh, Ryan Brown, and uh, I think Irish artist, and it's unbelievable. So I don't have many, but this – give me that damn thing. Why are you holding it so long? It's mine. Take it. I want to – Take it from me. Thing. I don't want to I don't want to screw that up and drop it. <sighs> Dude, this is so freaking cool. Yeah, it's pretty gorgeous. There's a whole aspect that I want to bring to the mic talking about, um, you know, in regards to variant comics. It kind of all fits in where – Painted covers versus digital, it's almost as if there should be some type of like different value assessment because I think of someone like Johnny Desjardins, right? You know, I'll be having a Zoom meeting with him, and this guy's got 30 different renditions of watercolor paintings that he's like testing out, you know? This is what it's like when he had to use blue first before I use the red. So now I got to redo all of this differently. What if I put the green after that? How does that change the painting? And there's all this like trial and error till it's perfected and then brought to the canvas for final art. You know, I've worked with Johnny on some covers that's taken him days to finish. Now, I'm all I'm a fan of digital art too. It's all art, but I think there's this added value to knowing that some of this stuff is kind of painstaking. You know, I think of like Van Gogh and the and the uh, Q-tips, you know, the the dot by dot paintings that he would do. With Q-tips. Right? Yeah. Isn't that what he did with it? He like did little dots? I don't know if Q-tips were invented back then, but... I'm pretty sure with... they were Q-tips, weren't they? <laughs> I'm showing my ignorance right now. Let me know in the comment section below. And how do you think Jeff did, you know? How do you think we did for like coming up with the idea of this cover? It was great because you also did a red eyes and a white eyes version on it too. So I've never seen it not foil, right? Did we? Did we? We only did foil versions of that variant. I no, think. the trade dress was uh, standard. There was a tra oh, the mail call one. Yeah, because I didn't. Yeah, I've, I've I've mostly seen the foil version, so this was like extra extra cool to me. All right. Well, let me know what you think about Gabriel Del Auto art in the comment section below. He's one of the greats. You know, a lot of my favorite artists call him like the current king. Of, of painted work. You know, some of his original art, you know, you, you paid, I think you said 15K for that. I've seen Gabriel Del Auto art that looks similar and not as quality as that hit twenty to $30,000 recently. 100%. When he said 15, I was like, okay, thank God. Okay, because I didn't want to go to like the 25, because I do, th he said he really loved this piece and was going to keep it in his personal collection. Like, but he said, if I can do, if I can do the 15, he would sell it. I was like, Sh shoot, yes. Okay, I'll do it. Um, and then they had a payment plan. I was like, perfect. I can keep it simple and just pay a little bit, sell a few things here and there and, and justify it. And then, um, but yeah, 20, I mean, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it's sold for 25. It's a, it is a beautiful piece in House of Secrets. It's a classic cover. I freaking love this. Cover. I'm so excited for this right now. So excited. So thank you for finally having an episode where I can open it. Appreciate it. If you like that cover, well, you could have gotten it as a one per box in our mystery box the mystery mail call, comictom101.com. But that was for a prior month. If you join now, you only got three, four days left to join. You got till the 15th at midnight. We're sending every member a boys number two, which is a triple key. First Kamiko, first Mother's Milk, and first Frenchie. Trade dress and virgins going out at rando. Rando. <laughs> rando <laughs> it just kind of came out of my <laughs> mouth. Did. I don't even know. <laughs> going out at random. Um, but we have a 
living horror legend Ben Temple Smith on the art, Homelander on the cover, homaging Neil Adams. We also teamed up with Davide Peratore, a outstanding artist who also trained under Gabriel Del Otto. When we released this ASM 29 at San Diego Comic-Con, people thought it was a Gab cover. And we're like, yo, this is like the next Gab. The kid's like 22 years old. Whoa, okay. So we were like low-key specking on this artist. I'm like, I got to get on the ground floor. I did it with Peach. I don't know. You tell me how I did with that. But we have a trade dress version, one per box, going out to every single member. I have a bunch of other stuff that I haven't even announced. Support the show directly. We'll send you some comics every single month with love. And it's $34.99 plus shipping. Best deal in comic books. And I have a surprise for you guys. You don't know about this. Um, Heron Heavens, shout out. You know her if you followed me on Whatnot. Joins me every single Whatnot Wednesday. But she went to Vietnam and she brought me back a present. And that's how old this is? That's how old this is. This has been sitting around. She's asked me a few times, but I had to like, oh, comic butch in the casa, by the way. Hit the like button for the comic Gato. He's going to like this. He's probably not actually, maybe he won't like this. But interesting. There are a lot of like unlicensed products being made out of the country, specifically Marvel, DC, and they do some fun stuff with them, okay? So I want to show you something that I assume, like, just like you were when you were going to comic conventions, you know, as a kid, you're, you're like, oh, mom, I got this second comic book I want to get. Look at the House of Secrets. I had, you, know, you had to, like, go mow lawns for it, you know? Well, there's not a whole lot of comic books in other countries, you know? They're tough to find if there are. And, you know, there's, like, toys as another option. There's a lot of toys that come out. Now, one thing I want to preface this with is uh, this is a Spider-Man item, all right? Spider-Man is beloved everywhere, you know, rivals Batman across the world. Well, Spider-Man doesn't really kill people, right? Um, maybe Gwen. <laughs> oh, my God, that's terrible, dude. <laughs> the Green Goblin. Uncle Ben. Yeah, you shouldn't let that guy get away. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, this got dark. Well... I want you to picture, like, you to picture yourself, you know, like, you got your kid there, they want to get a Spider-Man toy, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, it's like a kid thing, right? It's a superhero. You're going to love it, okay? And, uh, I'm gonna look. <laughs> I'm going to break open this, all right, comic fam? Um, take a look. You've uh, been hiding this good, because I'm here, like, every <laughs> day, for, and this, she went to Vietnam, like, months ago. This is a <laughs> Spider-Man toy for your children, comic fan. Oh, my God. And I want you to guys to describe it for our audio listeners, all right? Battery-operated Spider-Man. And first, I want you to see the case it came in, okay? Okay. Look at can this we case. Look? You can yeah. look at the case. I'm going to cover up a little bit here. But it looks like a normal, like, Spider-Man. It's like from the movie, from right? the original Tobey yeah. Maguire movie. Right, right, right. awesome. So this is a little bit different, okay? Battery-operated. Get ready. Duck it and cover, because Spider-Man's ready to shoot ya! <laughs> <laughs> Spidey doesn't swing, he military crawls? Uh, what, what is going on? No. What are you seeing, guys? Talk about this amazing toy that you can get your children. This is A-Team Spider-Man. He literally is military crawling on the floor with shoulder to shoulder with an AK-47. <laughs> He's rat-tatting the enemy. This is amazing. So yeah, he's just crawling across the table. He's got a gun, and uh, yeah, he, the 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 tip of the <laughs> rifle is is red. It actually lights up red. And I just thought this would be a cool thing to see. You know, people experience our superheroes differently in other countries. Comic fam, you gotta just be open to the diversity, yo. <laughs> I have never seen Butch voluntarily like jump off the table in the middle of a recording. He loves being up here with us, but he's, he's, we scared the crap out of him just now. What do you think about this, Ryan? Uh, this is amazing. I think we need a whole line of these uh, guys. You need like a like <laughs> he's got this giant rifle in his hands. He's got bare hands. He's hand. a high schooler from Queens, and he's got this thing. <laughs> He's I don't even know what kind of gun that is. It's a, it looks like something the Punisher would use. It's got a big scope on the top. Dude, like it, it, after Gwen had her like just terrible fall and tragic accident, I'm surprised that Peter just didn't say screw he's it. He's got a knife on his <laughs> Oh, he's got belt. a knife on his like Rob Liefeld pouch. Yeah, he's got a big utility belt and there's a huge like, combat knife just strapped to his back. 
This is a different kind of Spider-Man. Dude, it's basically spider boots, a spider shirt, no gloves. He's got bare hands, and then, like, <laughs> some jeans, blue jeans. Also, the eyes are way too far apart. They clearly just, like, re-sprayed some kind of, like, G.I. Joe or something they had. But, yeah. like, why did this pop in their head? <laughs> like, why do we need AK Spider-Man? Make it the Punisher. This would have worked a little a little better. But, you know, Spider-Man sells so much better, and you're right. You actually hit the nail on the head. Um, these toys are typically repurposed. You have the mold, and I've looked this up because, you know, Know, crash down. I'm on some toys, right? Like, how much does it cost to make a toy? We have to make a mold, and the cost to do that is, you know, for some companies between like five and ten thousand dollars. So to commit to something is expensive, which is why some toy releases you'll see that a lot of them are like the same size. There's little parts of the characters that are different, but overall, if you strip it down to just like the bare bones. Yeah, you know, maybe you can reuse the body. You can reuse this arm for another character. And in this case, it looks like they reused like a G.I. Joe and just made him Spider-Man because it sold better. I want to know your thoughts about this in the comment section below, comic fam. And you know what? As always. Geek responsibly. Enough said.